فاعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعظيمنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين المنتجبين أما بعد فقد قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا معشر الجن والإنس إن استطعتم أن تنفذوا من أقطار السماوات من أقطار السماوات والأرض فانفذوا لا تنفذون إلا بسلطان فبأي آلاء ربكما تكذبان صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته we began our discussion on the first night by resolving that the best way that we can change the world, the best way that we can improve the situation around us, is by first focusing on ourselves. In short, fix the world, uh, fix yourself before you fix the world. And over the nights we've been identifying various diseases of the soul to try and eliminate, and looking at certain characteristics to adopt that can help us in uh, this journey of self-improvement. And tonight we'll continue in that way. Once there was a man who was awoken early in the morning because he heard a racket that was coming from next door. That was coming from the house next door. He heard the sound of a saw and he heard someone who was exerting themselves a lot. So he looks out of the window and he looks into the garden and he sees that there's a, a middle-aged man who has a saw and he's trying to cut down a tree. So he's pushing the saw, pulling the saw with all his might. But the first man notices that no matter how hard he's pushing or pulling the saw, the tree isn't getting cut down. The saw's not moving. And that's because the saw is blunt. So the first man, he looks out of the window, he shouts across to the neighbor, says, what are you doing? He says, I'm trying to cut down this tree. He says, well, if you want to cut down the tree, then first you need to sharpen the saw. And the man replies, amusingly, he says, I don't have time to sharpen the saw. And this is the situation that we often find ourselves in, right? That we, uh, Stephen Covey, who I've quoted a couple of times, he identifies the difference between production and production capacity. That when we improve ourselves, one way we improve is by direct gains, and another is by helping uh, certain catalysts along the way that allow us to produce more gains. So production and production capacity. And in improving ourselves in certain ways, we can improve our production capacity. And tonight, inshallah, we'll focus on one of these areas which can multiply our production <coughs> capacity to beyond means that we could ever have previously imagined. And this secret, inshallah, that we'll discuss will be concerning knowledge. Knowledge and education. Ilm. And knowledge in the Holy Quran, it has an unrivaled status. It is very uh, highly adorned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in many different verses of the Holy Quran. The first of all of the revelations was Surah Al-Alaq, right? The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad He's 40 years old in the cave of Hira. The first Quranic revelation he receives is the command Iqra. Iqra bismi rabbika azim. Read in the name of your Lord. And the command I'lamu, which is fi'l amr for uh, commanding someone to learn, is mentioned over two dozen times in the Holy Quran. And Allah constantly, when He talks about a lost nation, He says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ If only they were amongst the people that were thinking. If only they had contemplated and pondered. He tells us directly to ask Allah for knowledge. In Surah Baha, verse number 114, قُلْ رَبِّي زِدْنِي عِلْمًا 
right? And in the verse that I recite at the beginning of the discussion, which is from Surah Rahman, verse number 33 to 34, Allah issues an interesting challenge to his creation. There are multiple interpretations to this verse. I'm just taking one which is relevant to this talk. And he says, O assembly of the jinn and men, speaking to both men and jinn, if you are able to pass through, if you're able to pierce through the layers of the heavens and the earth, then pass through. But you cannot do so without his divine authority. And then he goes on with that lovely ayah of Surah Rahman, which of his signs will you deny? And one of the interpretations of this verse is that Allah is challenging us to break all horizons, to go beyond whatever we could previously have imagined in terms of educating ourselves. And some say that you can even take this literally, that when he tells us to pierce through the skies, it means to go out from the Earth's atmosphere and explore the world, but always increasing in the currency of knowledge. And the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi we are told many different times in the Quran, the, the Prophet's uh, mission, it is um, discussed uh, succinctly. And in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 151, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have sent you to teach the book, to teach people the wisdom, and to teach them that which they do not know. So one of the key reasons why the Holy Prophet has been sent is to increase us in Ali. And indeed, when we look at the Holy Quran itself, the purpose of the Quran as well is to increase us in Ali. Allah tells us in Surah Sa'd, verse number 29, And it is a book that we have revealed to you, abounding in good over its verses that those endowed with understanding may be mindful. So Allah, when He is discussing the purpose of the Holy Quran, one of the most important purposes is that it gets us to think. It increases our knowledge and it pushes our horizons. And this station of, of, of knowledge, it's not just limited to the Holy Quran. When we look at the Ahadith and we look at the Ahlul Bayt, we find a similar emphasis on seeking knowledge. Usul al-Kafi, which is the most important primary Hadith source in the school of Ahlul Bayt, our brothers in the school of Ahl Sunnah, they have six, which they call the Sahih Sitta. Uh, the first two which, of which are Bukhari and Muslim. They call them the Sahih Hayy. And then they have uh, four <coughs> others. In the Shia school, we have four. There are four primary uh, hadith compilations, which were uh, historically, they were taken from the, the teachings of uh, Imam, Imam Sadiq alayhi wa sallam. Of the four, the most, uh, the principal amongst them is Usul al-Kafi, and it's organized thematically. Now, what is the first chapter in Usul al-Kafi? Is it Tawheed? Is it Adala, maybe? Perhaps it is Nubuwa, Imama, Qiyama, any of the Usul al-Din? No. The first chapter in Usul al-Kafi is on knowledge. It's on knowledge. Because it is only after ascertaining knowledge that we can begin to begin our journey in the direction of Tawheed. It's the only way that we can move towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we can look after our usuluddin and our furuuddin. And interestingly, when we look at other wajibat, there tend to be restrictions, right? There are restrictions on other wajibat as to when we have to do them. If we look at zakat, for example, you don't have to pay zakat unless you earn a certain amount of money, right? For hajj, you don't have to go for hajj unless you have istibar which includes the financial and the physical ability to make this journey, this pilgrimage, right? And what about salah? Well, it's not wajib until we have attained bulugh. It's good to do it before, but it's not wajib. And it's a similar case with salah. But with seeking knowledge, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He says, strive for knowledge from the cradle to the grave. There is no limitation whatsoever, unlike on some other wajibat. Again, because this is the key that allows us to truly appreciate what the other uh, of the usuluddin and furuuddin are that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us. And similarly, when we look at Ahlul Bayt, we find one of their greatest qualities is the knowledge that they have from Allah through the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Muhammad wa Muhammad. But sometimes when we look at the world today, we find the prime currency which people look for and the prime way that they measure success in this world is based on wealth. That the more wealth I can accumulate, the better job I have, the, how good a job is, is determined by how much money it makes. 
right? But Imam Ali, sallallahu wa sallam, who Ali. He teaches us that rather it is uh, knowledge which is superior to wealth. There's a tradition in uh, Sheikh Mufid's Amali where Imam Ali alayhi salam, he walks with Kumail after Salah, Salatul Aisha from Masjid al-Kufa. And as they're walking, there, there, there's, there's quite a few narrations like this where Imam Ali alayhi salam, releases these pearls of wisdom to Hazrat Kumail. And on this occasion, the piece of advice that he gives him is concerning knowledge and wealth. And he compares the two. And he says that you should hasten to those who are knowledgeable. Because knowledge is better than wealth. Why? Because number one, knowledge protects you, whereas you need to protect your wealth. When you spread wealth, it diminishes. It gets less because you have divided it. But when you spread knowledge, it <coughs> increases. And when you pass away, your wealth is useless to you. But if you are a person of knowledge, then that knowledge is immortalized. And it immortalizes you as well. There are other traditions as well, which are attributed to Imam Ali alayhi salam, which continue along this comparison. So there are other comparisons as well with knowledge and wealth, which include the fact that knowledge is the legacy of the prophets, whereas wealth is the legacy of the pharaohs. A man of wealth has many enemies, whilst a man of knowledge has many friends. The learned people tend to be more generous, whilst wealthy people tend to be more stingy. And whilst over time, wealth, it deteriorates, knowledge continues to accumulate. <coughs> And it illuminates the earth, whilst wealth tends to blacken it. And finally, when we gain knowledge, it tends to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whilst wealth tends to be invertly correlated with our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Indeed, Imam Ali was telling the truth when he said there is no wealth like knowledge and there is no poverty like ignorance. And the Ahlul Bayt, again, one of their prime qualities was the knowledge that they had established. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi He says in, in quite a famous tradition, which is recorded not just in the books of Ahlul Bayt, but if we look at, look at the books of Ahlul Sunnah as well, al Hakim's Mustadrak is a classic example, but also by Tirmidhi. The Holy Prophet says, Ana madinatul ilm wa aliyun babu. I am the city of knowledge, and Ali is its gate. So the Holy Prophet, again, he establishes his position as a fountain of what? Of knowledge above all else. And of course, Imam Ali salam, is the gate. And you don't get into the city unless you enter through the gate. Uh, and there's a slightly humorous uh, fabrication that's taken place regarding this hadith that I thought I'd, uh, I'd share. Uh, that some, it's not accepted by mainstream Sunni Muslims, but some put the hadith forward, they continue it, they say that Rasulullah is the city of, uh, of knowledge, Ali is its gate, Abu Bakr is the, 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 the floor, the foundations, or Umar is the walls, and Uthman is the roof. Uh, there's a lot of problems with the tradition from a technical perspective regarding chain of narration and whatnot, but you sort of wonder, well, it's almost derogatory to the other three khalifs, right? Because to get to knowledge, you have to trample on the first khalif, and walls stop you from entering into a city, right? So apparently the second Khalifa is the one who stops you from getting to the knowledge of the Prophet, and I don't know a single city in the world which has a roof. But regardless, Imam Ali alayhi salam is the gate to the city of knowledge. And it is only Imam Ali, only Imam Ali of all of the Sahaba, who can sit down and say, Saluni, Saluni, qabla an tufqiduni. Ask me, ask me before you lose me, and ask me anything. One of the other companions, as Jalaluddin al Suyuvi, who um, was a, a legendary Sunni scholar, he writes in his Tariq al Khulafa that the only, it was only Imam Ali alayhi salam who could sit down and say, Saluni, Saluni, qabla an tufqiduni. Nobody else ever asked for that. Nobody else challenged others to ask questions like that because not everybody had the answers. And it was the second Khalif who said about Imam Ali alayhi salam, again in Jalaluddin's Tariq al Khulafa, that, oh Allah, protect me from the time that I will ever be faced by a difficult problem when Ali ibn Abi Talib is not present. And indeed, knowledge is power. It is cliche, but it is very, very true. And if we look from a historical perspective, we find that the nations which tend to be more knowledgeable are the ones which are more successful. 
And in fact, forget history. Look at the way the world is today. The most successful countries in the world are those who have prioritized knowledge above others. And that is the, the reason behind their success, how the engine continues to turn. One of them, one of the reasons. There are other reasons as well. Just to state one historical example, we'll rewind about 70 years and we'll go to, back to World War II. In the run-up to World War II, Germany obviously adopted a very anti-Semitic stance. And as a result, a lot of the Jews within Germany, they migrated out. Many uh, were, were, were stuck there, in particular in Poland. But there was a brain drain of the country. And if this brain drain hadn't taken place, and the knowledge of those Jews had been valued, then perhaps, God forbid, you know, may Allah protect us from this, but God forbid, the Nazis could have won the Second World War. Because amongst the people who fled were Albert Einstein, who went to America and uh, published a number of, of, of groundbreaking papers in his miracle year, and von Neumann. And the ironic thing about von Neumann is that he was involved in the Manhattan Project, whereby the United States managed to construct the first nuclear bomb. Just imagine how history would have been different if the Nazi had valued knowledge. Perhaps, perhaps they would have been the first of the atomic bomb, and then history would be very different to the way that it is today. And if we look at the great illuminaries of history, again, it has been their knowledge and their education that has allowed them to be prepared to pounce on the moment when the winds of history are correct. If we look at Gandhi, for example, he was educated in University College London. Or Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was responsible for the, uh, for the independence of Pakistan, he was educated in a number of universities as well. But they're ready. We don't expect to see the impact of knowledge straight away. We learn, but then it means we are prepared. There's a, an old fable, I, I think it's attributed to Esau, that once in the woods there was a boar. A boar is like a, a, a large male pig. And it was sharpening its tusks on a tree. A fox approaches the boar and says, Oh boar, the forest is quiet. There are no hunters. Why is it that you now sharpen your tusks? The boar turns to the fox and smiles and says, Well, there are no hunters about today. But when the hunters come, do you think I'll have time to sharpen my tusks then? So by educating ourselves, we sharpen our tusks and we are prepared for when those crucial moments in our life come, we can pounce on them. And one thing that formal education does, which is, which is very useful, and I think it's particularly important for the youth and for the kids to appreciate this point. Formal education through uh, primary school, secondary school, uh, GCSEs, A-levels, that sort of thing, and then a university degree, it also acts as a safety net. Now, we look out and we see, uh, I don't know, Cristiano Ronaldo, right? How much money did he make last year? He made about 30 million euros, roughly. Or Messi somehow made more, I, I don't know how, since it was Ronaldo's year last year, but whatever. Or how about, sorry? No, no, no. So it was, uh, he makes 30 million euros, uh, Messi makes 40 million, or if we go down to a slightly younger generation, how about YouTube? We look at YouTubers and we're envious, right? Because they sit down in front of a computer screen, they play games, they shout into the camera, and they make millions of pounds. Right? PewDiePie is, is probably the most famous example. He made $12 million last year. $12 million. And a lot of the time, the youth, the kids, they look at this and they think, wow, that could be me. Why don't I do that? And part of the problem is that what they don't appreciate always is that for every Cristiano Ronaldo, there'll be 100,000 failures. For everyone that made it big, there'll be so many more that didn't make it. They say that Steve Jobs dropped out of college, uh, Bill Gates dropped out of college, Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of college. Well, again, they're one in a million, right? Most of the people who you look around who dropped out of college, they struggle. They struggle, or they need to get their education back before they can move on to a higher portion in life. And if we look at average income, right? Because the average person is, believe it or not, average, right? That's, that's what the word means. So if we look at average income of various occupations, CEO isn't even at the top. Right? Footballers don't even make the top 10 globally. One of the most well-paid professions in the world on average. Surgeons, physicians, pilots, engineers. And CEO comes in the list slightly later on. So what a formal education allows you to do is to make sure that you have the future safe. You have it. Now, if you want to go and chase a YouTube career, if you want to go and become a footballer, by all means, bismillah. But if we have our formal education with us, 
should our dreams fail, and the larger they are, the more from a statistical perspective, the more likely they are to fall through, then at least there's a fallback. At least there's a way to continue to move forward. But now that we've established the importance of knowledge itself, I think we'll spend the rest of the discussion talking about certain uh, pieces of advice concerning knowledge. Because we live in an age of information, but also of misinformation. And there is a lot of trouble out there when it comes to gaining knowledge. So the first piece of advice, uh, I think it's quite important to make sure that we state our sources, or at least we have our sources to hand. Because if we don't, we end up getting lost in a circle of only people who agree with us. That we sit down in a gathering of everyone who agrees, we'll talk religion or politics or whatever it is, and everyone everyone around will, will just agree. They'll not, and they'll smile, no matter how ridiculous it is, whatever you're saying. But as soon as you try and discuss with someone who has a different opinion, the situation changes, because they'll contradict you. And if you don't have sources, number one, you don't necessarily know what you're saying is true, and number two, you won't be able to convince somebody who doesn't believe you. Okay? So I'll give one example, just to, just to demonstrate this. Again, we'll return to, to World War II. Has anyone heard of Unit 731? We've heard of the Nazi concentration camps, they're quite famous. But a lot of the crimes, in fact the majority of World War II didn't take place on the Western Front. Most of it was on the East, either between the Russians and the Germans or uh, between the Japanese and, and, and China. They had set up a, um, what's the, what, what do they call it, a, sort of a research facility. So that was like the, 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 the alias. And in this facility, they conducted the worst kind of experience, whatever you can imagine, is the most horrible and disgraceful thing to do to a human being, they did it. And they did much worse, much worse than what you can imagine. Uh, to state one example, I, I tried to choose the most, uh, one that I can actually say from here, uh, frostbite. General Shiro Ishii, who was the, 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 the head surgeon, the head uh, the, the general uh, of, of this department, he was very proud of the insights he developed into <coughs> frostbite. So frostbite, it's a condition that you get by when you're exposed to cold, your body prioritizes your internal organs before your external organs. So blood circulation to your fingers and your extremities shuts down, while blood is sent to your heart, your liver, your brain, etc., etc. But if this shutdown continues because the temperature is so low for an extended period of time, the fingers will start to turn black and they'll fall off. It's extremely painful. And you, you know, see, after the necrosis, you don't get the limbs back. So they would take people, they'd soak them in water, and they'd throw them in the coldest of conditions, and they'd leave them there. And every now and again, they'd come in and they'd hit their arms, they'd hit their legs, see if they'd break off, uh, just to develop an understanding of how frostbite works. Now, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Unit 731 is because of what happened next. After the war was over, right, and they were captured, surely, surely, they would be put to justice, right? They killed thousands, millions. Surely the Japanese responsible would be put to justice. Well, not so much. Because when the United States got there, they decided, you know what, this information is quite cool. It's quite unique. We're not going to be able to get this information any other way. So they engaged in talks with the scientists there, and they gave them all complete and utter diplomatic immunity, including General Shiro Ishii himself. Not one of them was punished. Now, if you're talking to an American jingo, if you're talking to someone who's very patriotic about the United States, and you, you say this fact, so let's take your typical Trump supporter, and you say this fact, what are they going to say? They're, they're going to call you a conspiracy theorist. But if you have a source at hand, and you quote Hal Golding's Unit 731 testimonies, where he followed up the Japanese uh, who were responsible for what happened and took testimonies from 24 individuals, now suddenly the onus is on them to respond. So if we have the source, number one, we know what we're saying has a more likely chance of being true. But number two, it allows communication with people outside of our narrow field of thought. So, keep the sources, number one. Number two is when it comes to knowledge, it's important to maintain a balance. Especially in today's world, where sometimes we get lost in hyper-specialization and we become ignorant about all other issues. In Iran, there is a national holiday called Engineers' Day. And it is celebrated after the great Shia scholar Nasruddin Atosi. And this great man, not only was he one of the most remarkable Shia scholars in all of history, he was an architect, he was a biologist, he was a physician, and he managed to put all of these qualities together in one individual, and it's an inspiration. And when we look back towards the Islamic Golden Age, we find, again, 
And then all different forms of knowledge are valued. It's not just Islamic knowledge. It's not just knowledge of the science. It's not just politics. But all together is one. And that was the, the reason why we have an Islamic golden age. Because they were an engine for success in that time. Just to state a couple of examples, Al-Khawarizmi, he was a famous mathematician. He was the one who invented algebra. Algebra is named after his first book. He's the reason behind algorithms. He invented algorithms, named after the Latinized version of his name, Al-Khawarizmi, Algorithmi. And you can't have a computer. You, you have a phone, you have a computer, you live in the world today. You can't, you can't go about your daily life without having Al-Khawarizmi there. And he was the one who was responsible for transferring the Indian units and replacing the, uh, the Roman numerals, which were very clumsy at the time. Or if we look at Ibn Sina, who is the most famous, probably the most famous Islamic scholar of the Golden Age. He, uh, known in Western tradition as Avicenna, he published his canon of medicine, which, ma which was maintained as a textbook for medicine in the West, in all around the world, actually, up until the 17th century. Their knowledge was such in all subjects, not just Islamic knowledge, not just secular knowledge, in all subjects was such that if anybody wanted to learn anything, they had to learn the language of Arabic and they had to travel to the Middle East. In the same way that today, if you want to go forward in academia, you need to know English, it was back in the Islamic Golden Age, it was the time of Arabic. Because they understood the importance of various different parts of knowledge and the influence that knowledge can have. If we don't, then we are at the mercy of those who know more than us. And if anyone's uh, interested in, in having a look afterwards, the reason I, I insert this point here is because I watched a debate between Hamza Sortes and Lawrence Krauss. It's available on YouTube. And they're debating the existence of God. And I remember watching it, and I was, with all due respect <coughs> to, to Hamza, he's done a lot uh, in, in, in the way of da'wah in, in teaching Islam. So he's a very educated Sunni brother. But the debate was a shamble. It was unfortunate. Because though he knew his Islamic knowledge well, he had no real knowledge of physics or of mathematics. And if you're debating one of the world's most foremost cosmologists and astrophysicists, you kind of know at least a little bit of science, right? You've got to know at least a little bit of physics. After you watch that debate, have a look at the same physicist, Lawrence Krauss, debating Dr. William Lane Craig. He's a Christian apologetic an evangelist. And the debate is completely different. Because although Dr. Cray is still, he's a Christian specialist, he knows enough about other fields that he has a basic level of competence. So the same tricks that Krauss used and worked on Hamza, they did not work on Dr. Cray at all. And, it's, and the, 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 the quality of the debate is completely different. So, balance in knowledge. Number three is to make sure that we respond to the problems and adversities that we face using the knowledge that we have procured. George Bernard Shaw is quoted to have said that Islam is the best religion, but with the worst followers. And if you look at the way that Islam is portrayed in the media today, you kind of <coughs> agree with it. Because I think the worst enemies to Islam today are Muslims, no doubt. And it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. So. There's uh, so many examples that, that I can give, but let's take the Qur'an burning example. A couple years back, there's a, a, an extremist pastor in the United States who wants to burn Qur'ans. And he, he's doing it as a public stunt. By law, he wasn't allowed to, by the way, so it was obvious he was never going to do it. But he says he's going to burn Qur'ans. What do Muslims do? What do Muslims do? Let's have a look at Pakistan, right? They get so irate, they get so angry, they run out onto the streets, they set the buses on fire, and they start shouting all sorts of crazy slogans, which are utterly reprehensible. This guy wanted to incite a reaction, and the Muslims gave it to him. They gave it to him, and it was a wonderful uh, fuel for, for newspapers, tabloid newspapers that, that thrive off that kind of information. But if we use the knowledge that we've procured about the way that human psychology works, about the way that publicity works, the story would have been different. The Hope Not Hate organization, which is a, a pacifist organization within the UK, they responded by petitions and by peaceful means. And that pastor who was going to come over to the United Kingdom, he was banned. He wasn't allowed in. He was barred by the Foreign Office. So if we approach the problems that we have with knowledge in the same way that Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa 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 alayhi
So just to take one example, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi He's approached by the man, by a man in the mosque, who comes, he comes with a, with a bone of an animal, and he crushes the bone into little pieces, into dust, and he blows it away into the wind. He says, Ya Rasulullah, are you honestly telling me that somebody or someone or something will gather all of these distant particles of this bone and put them back together? That will be, will have a second life, an akhara? What did the Holy Prophet respond? And this story is recorded in Surah Yasin. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi responds, قُلْ يُحْيِيَ الَّذِي أَنْشَأَهَا أَوَّلَ مَرَّةً وَهُوَ بِكُلَّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ That the one who will bring it back to life is the one who gave it life in the first place. Is it not more difficult for someone or something or whatever this man is referring to to give life to something in the first place than to bring it back together after it is first lived? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa Muhammad. The next advice concerning knowledge is to know our limits, to know our, our limitations. Because if we gather a little bit of knowledge and we overestimate ourselves, we end up causing more harm than good. In the first night, we talked again on the theme of fix yourself before you fix the world. That doesn't mean we put Amr bil ma'roof and nahi anil munkar to the side. Because they're still important. But sometimes we go out to do Amr bil ma'roof, but because of our ignorance, we actually encourage evil. Or we forbid the good. There's a, a beautiful story of Imam al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa That he was once told about a, a luminary within the community. And he was told that there's a very educated person here who we all revere. So the Imam, he says, I, I want to meet this individual. Who is he? He follows instructions and he goes and finds this man in the market. But before he manages to speak to him, he sees this man, he goes towards one of the stalls, one of the market stalls. And when the shopkeeper is not looking, he grabs two pieces of bread and hides them under his cloak. The imam is looking, thinking, is this the right guy? He then continues, and this man walks to the next stall. And when the shopkeeper isn't looking, he steals two more things, puts them under his cloak. Then he walks away. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam follows him until this man then stops by some very poor people, some <coughs> destitute, and he gives them everything that he has stolen. So Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam, he can't believe what he's just seen. He approaches the man, he asks him, what on earth are you doing? What is this? You're stealing and then you're giving it to the poor? And the man in a, quite a, an arrogant, haughty fashion, he says to Imam al-Sadiq, he says, you're the one they call Ja'far al-Sadiq, right? Well, let me educate you about what you've just seen. You know, SubhanAllah. He talks to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam like this. He says, let me educate you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us that every bad deed we do, we get one punishment. But every good deed we do, we get ten rewards. Oh, Ja'far al-Sadiq, it's simple mathematics. Simple maths. That I stole four things. Astaghfirullah, may Allah forgive me. I have committed four sins. But then I gave four items to charity. So I did four good deeds. Times that by 10, that's 40. 40 minus 4 is 36. Alhamdulillah, I am a good person. <laughs> <laughs> Imam Asadat alayhi salam takes, maybe takes a moment or two to recover from this stupidity. He responds by saying, you know, oh, what are you doing? Just let's, let's do the math. You want to do maths? Let's do the maths. But let's do it properly this time. You stole four items from four innocent shopkeepers. You then went on and distributed four stolen pieces of property. That's four plus four, that's eight. That's eight sins you've committed and you've got no reward. <coughs> and the man is silent. He's dumbfounded because he hasn't thought about it like this. And this is what happens when sometimes we overestimate our own intelligence. <coughs> so Imam al he says to this person that, that sometimes when people don't educate themselves or they don't, they're not knowledgeable enough, they'll end up causing more harm than they do good. And that is why Alama Iqbal, the great Pakistani poet, he writes in, forgive my Urdu, Allah se kare do, to taaleem bhi fitna, imlaak bhi olaad bhi jaghir bhi fitna, na haq ke liye uthe to shamshir bhi fitna, shamshir to kya, na rai takbir bhi fitna. But if we distance ourselves from Allah, 
then what then whatever we rise for whatever we have whether it is our, our wealth our children or anything then it is all fitna it is all uh, it, it divides the community and it's something which is negative if we don't rise for haq in the name of Allah then the sword itself becomes fitna but forget the sword even saying Allahu Akbar becomes a fitna and we see this how prescient of Allah my Allah that we look in the Middle East today, we find certain organizations that will be shouting Allahu Akbar whilst they commit the worst of deeds. Why? Because they are completely lost. They have no hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have overestimated their own intelligence. And this is one of the reasons why taqlid is so important. As an institution, the reason we have maraja, though there are, of course there are issues where they disagree amongst each other. There's no doubt about it. And sometimes there are areas of confusion, particularly when it comes to Eid. But the reason why we have Maraja in the first place, the reason why we follow them is because they are more educated than us. And if we say get rid of the Maraja'iyya completely, we'll still be doing Taqlid. But we'll be doing Taqlid to our own whims and desires and our own limited education. So from being divided between two or three major Maraja, we'll be divided in our many. So this is part of the wisdom behind Taqlid. The next advice concerning knowledge is to focus on the next generation. Because it is the next generation that are the future. And when we send our children out to school every day, make no mistake, they are entering into an intellectual battlefield. Because when, in the world today, again, age of information, disinformation, social media, people around them, they will constantly give them information, whether true or false, that, will, that, that, that is like a storm that pushes them in all different directions and confuses them and they don't know what is going on. If we don't do our duty and educate them, then we are sentencing them to a ruined life. And they will lose, well, may Allah protect us, but their iman can be in doubt and in difficulty. And again, on issues of Islam, and also in issues of schooling, getting the top grades and being an inspiration. Okay, when we get the top grades, we carry the flag of Islam, we do our religion proud, we bring, we bring people towards it. But if we are at the bottom of our class, or we're not very educated in worldly senses, then we push people away. The next advice concerning knowledge, the penultimate one, is to use our knowledge upon which we build our faith. If we look at the New Atheist Movement, people like Richard Dawkins, the late Christopher Hitchens, uh, Sam Harris is, is probably the new guy on the street, they berate faith. They talk down upon the very concept of faith. Christopher Hitchens calls faith, uh, he calls religion a poison. And Dawkins calls faith evil because it requires no justification. But from an Islamic perspective, from an Islamic perspective, our faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our understanding of the religion of Islam is entirely based on the knowledge that we have procured. No prophet ever went to their nation and said, I'm a prophet from God, <coughs> believe me. And when they asked, what is your proof? They said, no, nah, just believe me. Now, no one would follow this prophet. They came with miracles. Right? They came with proofs that they had with them. So there is two types of faith that are conflated when these new atheists put this position forward. One is blind faith and one is evidence-based faith. And Dawkins, I find, is the best one to give us the, 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 the analogy in a, a lecture that he writes to his daughter. He says that there are two types of faith, blind faith and evidence-based faith. Blind faith is when a teenager thinks a celebrity loves them. Right? So they'll turn on the channel, they'll see... I don't know, whatever singer is at the top of the charts or someone from their most recent rom-com. No idea. And they'll think that person loves them. But there's no evidence base behind that. There's no knowledge underlying that. It's blind faith. Most cert almost certainly. You know, mathematically, there's still a possibility, but almost certainly there's no love between them. But how do you know your wife loves you? Well, you know because there are hints. There is some evidence there. Tones of the voice. The way that they look at you. The way that you interact with them. And that is enough upon which you build faith, in which you believe that that is the case. Right? So there's an evidence base, and then you're reasonable to make that faith based leap. And this idea that faith, uh, uh, was, again, it's Dawkins who says, I have no faith, it's absurd. And again, it is, it is, he's committing a fallacy of equivocation because he's confusing blind faith and evidence based faith. And that is why Albert Einstein, he said, and slightly long quote, but where are we? He says that science is, it can only be created by those who are thoroughly imbued with the aspiration towards truth and understanding. But this source of feeling, however, springs from religion. 
To this there also belongs the faith that the regulations valid for the world of existence are rational, that is comprehensible to reason. I cannot imagine a scientist without that profound faith. So in simple words, what he's saying is that for science to function, you must first, first have faith, blind faith, in the fact that the universe, number one, makes sense, and number two, I can make sense of it. Only after that faith can you have this knowledge of the world. And he summarizes it in an image, and he says, quote, Science without religion is lame, and religion without science is blind. So I think that summarizes this point quite well. The final piece of advice concerning knowledge is that we make sure that we act upon it. Because if we don't act on the knowledge that we've, that we've gathered, then it becomes baggage. It actually weighs us down rather than helping us. The analogy Allah gives in the Quran, in Surah Al-Jumu'ah, is كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُ أَسْفَارِ that they are like donkeys carrying books. They have the knowledge, but they don't use it. So there is a difference between a Muslim and a Mu'min. There is a difference between one who has the knowledge on his tongue and one who has the knowledge in his heart. Now, the Islamic philosophers, they say there's three levels of knowledge. Well, the first level, and the analogy is if, if, if you're, God forbid, your house is on fire. The lowest level of knowledge is someone tells you your house is on fire. The second level of knowledge is that you see your house is on fire. And the final level of knowledge is that you are in the house, God forbid, and you feel the heat of the flames, and you smell the stink of the smoke. That is the highest level of knowledge. And that is the knowledge that we have reached when we achieve yaqeen. But knowledge without hidayah, if we don't have guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it becomes useless in the end. Allah tells us in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 282, Allah, wa Allahu bi kulli shay'in alim. Be careful of your duty to Allah. Allah teaches you and Allah knows all things. So ultimately, the way we climb that ladder of knowledge, the way that we turn our knowledge from theory into practice, the way we turn the materials that we have been given into uh, a positive existence is through hidayah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through self-purification, through making ourselves the best people we can be by fixing ourselves before we fix the world.